É, bom, pessoal, boa tarde a todos que já estão aqui presentes, assistindo uma vez mais no Sebimário. Hoje teremos a presença do Marco Stello, que é nosso convidado especial, e teremos ainda uh, para argudir ou ajudar na discussão o Sérgio Flotter, da Universidade Federal Santa Catarina, e o Dr. Rubson Pinheiro, do Centro de Biologia Marina aqui do Sebimário. Então, thanks uh, for all for accepting this invited. It's very nice opportunity for talk more about the work smart and well the the world is yours in this moment and i will i retire in this sergio and me and Jackson. okay yeah okay thank you uh john pablo and uh, thank you sergio because uh, a few weeks ago sergio gave a talk like this at uh, another meeting i was at so i was so impressed with his slides and his research i hadn't realized how much uh, your group had been doing that i contacted him and then he put me in touch with John Pablo, and and now now we're all here together. So, uh, just these chance meetings are always very uh, enjoyable and interesting. The things we discover that other people are doing. Um, so, I'm going to um, point out a few questions that you may rise in the literature and people may hear about. So, IPBS still uh, says that one million species face extinction, but actually it's an estimated one million. But they leave out these details in the media releases. Um, <clears throat> and I will challenge some of these statements. And there's papers out there saying that there's millions, billions, or trillions of species on Earth. Um, and uh, when you read these papers, then you realize they don't actually say what a species is. So they're just using the word species very loosely, in which case it could be anything. But uh, the numbers of species that exist is of interest because people say that species are going extinct faster then we can uh, even describe them. Uh, Jim Thomas, who's a good friend of mine, works on amphipod crustaceans, has said this in one of his papers. And when I was at university, which is a long time ago now, uh, well, no, I'm still at university, but still learning, but uh, when I was a student, some of the things we were told were that most species were microscopic, most species were marine, and most marine species occurred in the deep sea. And you can find this still in, in papers coming being published recently, that the number of taxonomists was decreasing. There's lots of papers saying this, but they never provide much evidence. And that marine species richness peaks at the equator. So kind of by accident, I was always interested in biogeography, and I started looking at some of these things. So I imagine some of you, um, when I give a live talk, I usually ask people to put up their hands and say who has heard one, two, or three, or four, or five of these things. And usually quite a lot of people, everybody's heard of one or two of them, might even believe them. I spent the last uh, 16 years in New Zealand, and one of the nice traditions there in the Maori is that when you meet any group of people first, you introduce yourself, you have a whakapapa, which is your origin. So I'll start with that, and then I'll talk a little bit about biodiversity informatics and the data and what these databases are showing about how many species exist. And more recently, we've been studying the patterns in biogeography. And then, you know, so what? These are interesting things. I tried to put some of the applications and the, why these are important. So I was born in <coughs> Ireland near Dublin. Um, and um, <clears throat> I studied in Galway for my bachelor's degree and in Cork for my PhD. And then I was very lucky because there was almost less jobs. <coughs> Excuse me. Less jobs in the 1980s than there are today. I got a postdoc in Plymouth and then a second postdoc in Scotland. And after that, I um, got a position, a teaching position back in Ireland where I was teaching for six years and I set up a consulting company called EcoServe, which I ran for a few years. But I married a Canadian and this took me to Canada for a few years. Um, and that position was ending and then I took uh, a more Permanent, a permanent position in New Zealand. Um, but New Zealand is a long way from family and friends in Europe and Scotland and Canada, where our families are. So we have moved back to Norway last year. <clears throat> and I'd like to acknowledge my family and all the many people that I've worked with over the years that have contributed to my learning, because they also contribute not by doing research, but also by asking good questions. And when I prepare lectures, I'm all the time trying to think about how <clears throat> 
you know, getting more evidence from research that supports these these questions and finding out what we don't know, because what we don't know is also almost more important than what we do know. <clears throat> and when I was an undergraduate student, I still remember the day that uh, one of the lecturers who he died last year, um, but he told me about the theory of biogeography. And I was amazed because suddenly I could see that there was a, a quantitative theory that helped explain the patterns we see in nature. And I was always interested in nature uh, and biodiversity, but um, uh, it always just seems so incredibly um, random in a way and what finding out the patterns. So I always had this interest. And the public have been interested in this for thousands of years. There's still a lot of public interest in discovering species. During the census of marine life, the most popular media releases uh, were about discoveries of new species. And the public expects scientists to be going out and naming new species. We don't have to have economic benefits for everything. Um, and if we go back to the three of the major religions of the world, in the Christian religion, apparently, according to the Old Testament, the only thing God asked people to do, and he only asked men to do it, um, if you notice here, he asked man to bring each species to him and give it a name. So that was over 3,000 years ago. And um, in the Holy Quran, they also, Allah also said to Adam, tell them the names of these things, which was a little bit more recent. And the Sikh Holy Scriptures even came up with an estimate uh, more than 1,000 years ago um, about that there are millions of species taking birth and 8 million and 400,000 species might exist. <clears throat> now, of course, in all these cases, what do they mean by species? We're assuming they all mean more or less the same concept we're talking about today. So this has been an interesting question, and I must find it amusing when I sometimes submit papers. We're looking at this question and referees say, this is not an interesting question. Why should you publish this? <laughs> so, but fortunately, the other referees are interested. And if we start with the marine environment, it's important because the oceans have the older and greater evolutionary diversity than land and fauna and flora. So there's 13 phyla that are endemic, only occur in the oceans, whereas there's only one in terrestrial and that has got fossil marine relatives and zero freshwater ones. So it's a good place to start. And there's lots of extraordinary marine species. And when many members of the public look at these extraordinary species, they say the ocean has more diversity. It's got more diversity, perhaps in morphology and phylogenetic diversity. Um, than terrestrial systems, which is true. But when we add the numbers of species up, it's a little bit different. And some of the problems um, in the past with naming species have been that people have looked at local studies or one taxa. So they're always looking at a small sample. We're always looking at samples of the earth and trying to see how representative this sample is of the bigger picture. Um, and we needed a global context. And also there were many synonyms or aliases in the literature. So a hundred years ago, and even today, anybody can describe a species and give it a name. But today, people are a bit stricter and they will only accept the first name. And if you describe a species again, they will ignore the new name. Um, but tidying up this confusion of menticulture is still happening today. And in some of the databases I'll talk about later, we have reduced the numbers of species in the databases by 20% in the last few years by tidying up these synonyms. And a lot of this. Uh, problem in counting species and estimating species has been partly solved by having world databases. And the three databases I was very privileged to help get started were the World Register of Marine Species, the, um, the Species 2000, which includes worms and freshwater and terrestrial species, so it's all species, and uh, a marine species distribution system, the Ocean Biogeographic, or now called the Ocean Biodiversity Information System which has geographic data on species. And when we name a species, uh, this is one I named during my PhD, um, you have both the species name and the authors and the year. And initially, we were only looking at the year. We thought this was interesting. But later, I looked at the authors as well. So this is the problem with synonyms. These two fish, which are very quite common here in Norway, actually, Linnaeus named them. Um, look very different, but he didn't know that one was the male and one was the female. So that's a good reason for having separate species and they need to be synonymized. But there are much worse cases. The sperm whale, which even children can probably identify, um, has got 19 scientific names. Um, in fact, some of the scientists, Linnaeus, described the sperm whale three times. 
and other famous scientists did the described it multiple times as well. So this creates a, a incredible mess of names in the literature. Um, and that's not even the worst example. The, other, the more popular group of species, the more names they have, be they birds and fish and mammals. And these humpbacked whales in the Northwest Atlantic have 46 scientific names and nearly twice that number of common names. And we hope that this trend is decreasing. So along this graph here, and I have a few graphs of this style, which start with 1750s for Linnaeus started naming species up to recent years. And on the upper, the vertical axis, I've got numbers of species. Um, and the red line here shows the numbers of valid species per year. And the other line below it is the numbers of synonyms per year. But we don't know really, we think this looks like less valid species, but we don't know how in the future, with new genetics and new analyses and new comparisons, some of these species will no doubt be reduced to synonyms as well. So not only are we describing more species every year, nearly 2,000 marine species, but we're synonymizing almost the same number in recent years. Over all that time period, if we compare land and freshwater, and they're on different axes here because there's up to um, 6,000 um, land species described per year, and on the marine, it's, it's usually over 1,000 <coughs> recently. And um, we can see this long-term trend, a big increase and a big peak about 100 years ago, a decrease during the world wars, <coughs> which didn't happen in South America, in fact, um, but happened in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and on land, the numbers of species being described really hasn't changed much, but it has changed for marine species. And so in the marine environment, we have really been in the age of discovery for the last 50 years. <clears throat> All the marine, most marine laboratories have been built in this period, very few earlier, um, and lots of more ships and cruises and more research in the ocean. And this trend with the marine has still been increasing. So even I haven't updated this graph now in a few years, but the, the trend has been upwards uh, recently, continuously. And if we look at the numbers of authors describing those species, and I didn't do this in our first papers because I assumed that the number of authors was the same or decreasing, I was really surprised when for the marine and for the catalogue of life or species 2000 non-marine, the numbers of authors have been increasing by a huge amount. And the difference in these two lines here, and it's, it's barely visible in this one, is if we take only the first author and we take all the authors of a paper. Because in recent years, uh, since the 1980s, it's been more common to have more than one author uh, name with a species, often two or three. Um, but even if we ignore that and take the first author, so it's just been a huge increase in the, in the science. And this is the same in all sciences, medical sciences uh, in the world since uh, the 1950s and 60s, though all sciences have had an increased effort. So those previous graphs, looking at the numbers of species per year, aren't taking into account the taxonomic effort. And that there's different ways of estimating effort. Um, one is by the numbers of publications. And if we compare number of publications, to number of authors, they're very highly correlated by 0 0.9 something by different studies. And if we look at the numbers of authors in new species and people have done this, they find it's increasing on all continents and especially in Asia and South America in the recent decades. So numbers of authors is, is the, is, is one of the best available indicators of effort. And we can have minimum and maximum numbers of authors. So if we divide the number of species by the number of authors, like the catch, fishing catch, or some other method, we're actually catching less species per unit effort now than before. So this was also quite a big surprise to us. And we looked into this in detail, and other people, Lucas Joppa and others have done the same, and everybody finds the same pattern. So this suggests that really it is getting harder to find new species now, um, and that the, the effort is out. The reason we're still finding so many is because there's so many scientists and so many scientists collecting data, which is great news, I think. I think this is a really positive message for the, the, the science of taxonomy and how exciting it is. Um, and in a, a global review um, uh, published in Current Biology by Ward Appletons was the lead author, and over 100 and of other editors in the World Register Marine Species, we use three different methods to estimate the numbers of unknown species, the percentage in samples, a statistical model, and expert opinion. And the appendices of this paper are very interesting. If you're interested in a particular taxa, definitely look at the appendices. <clears throat> 
So we had over 100 studies uh, we found where they said how many species were not described or they could not name. And um, we don't know how many of those species overlapped between studies, but just to take 100 samples, the mean and the median were very close. So roughly one third of the species in these studies were unnamed. So this provides a very practical field estimate. So, okay, maybe we know two thirds of species. And of course, these, all these studies vary between taxa, geographic locations, and so on. We have a statistical model, which is published, um, which takes into account the variation between years and produces 95% confidence limits. So this fitted the past data. Uh, we were using this for Europe in the uh, test case very well. And it's better than other statistical models because often they don't take into account the variability between years. <clears throat> so if we compared all three methods, in this graph, the red dots are the, uh, the red diamonds are the expert opinion, and the circles are the uh, model predictions, and the, the blue is the number of named species. So we can see that the expert opinions for a few groups at the top here, the chromista, which is the algae, nematodes, and flatworms, are very different than the other groups. But in fact, most groups, the numbers of species, the, all these methods agree, um, which is contrary to what people say as well. People often say that things don't agree when in fact, most of the time we agree. And af one year after this, uh, a new a paper by the algal experts, the same people who were involved in this paper, they reanalyzed the algal data and they greatly reduced the number of algae. So it is now much more in line with these other estimates. And similarly, another paper on marine nematodes um, estimated about 15,000 species, not the millions that people had been suggesting earlier. And then if we look at other independent studies on different taxonomic groups, we find that many of these groups, they say we already know 77%, 75, two thirds, for, or at least half of species even in soil ciliates. So in fact, our Analyses are largely supported that we roughly know at least two thirds of named taxa and in some groups uh, up to 80%. And in, marine ma and in mammals, of course, and birds and some of the terrestrial groups is closer to 90%. So it's very exciting when they discover new species. And another way of looking at this is by looking at the past. And if we compare the number of species described in any year with the number already known, this is very highly correlated, which suggests that the number of new species is proportional to the number of species we already know. In other words, what we already know is a reasonable sample of diversity on Earth. So in this graph here, we can see the insects are way up here with nearly a million, and the terrestrial, the flowering plants are, are the next highest. Um, so most insects are terrestrial. So in fact, almost 85% uh, um, of species on Earth are actually terrestrial. And even if we leave those groups out, we still have very significant relationships. So if we take these proportions of species that are not known with the numbers that are known, um, these are estimates and I've, I've, I've reduced the overall estimate of fresh, freshwater and terrestrial a little and marine to account for unnamed synonyms, unrecognized synonyms. So, I roughly end up with then an unknown number and a number. So this is about 2 million species on Earth. And if we actually go back in the literature, Bob May and Kevin Gaston and other eminent scientists initially were suggesting numbers of around 2 million species on Earth. But then everybody got very excited with uh, Urban's estimate of the, the rainforest and Fred Grassel's estimate of deep sea diversity. So uh, even Bob May told me, um, I asked, why did he just change his mind from one paper to the next? And he said he was, influ he was biased by the opinions of the specialists. So he thought he was being too conservative in his first estimates and he started revising his upwards. So we have to be very careful how we're being biased by what we read and what we hear from other people. It's, it's always much better to look at the numbers and try to make up our own opinions. You might get in trouble about doing it, of course. Um, and the criticisms is where people say, well, what about the microscopic species, the parasites and deep sea? So I'll give some examples. <clears throat> Um, so if we include in the microscopic the, the, the um, bacteria, protozoans, nematodes, and other microfauna, they actually make up a very small number of species, of named species. They're not most, most of the 
species on Earth are actually insects, crustaceans, mollusks, and these middling sized species. But some, to some people, these one millimeter species are still small because they're comparing them to uh, large things like birds and mammals. But the very small things are less diverse. And there's a, a 100 year old theory as to why that is the case. Um, in the marine environment, there seem to be relatively more of these very small species, which may be something to do with the aquatic environment, but hasn't been uh, studied in any detail. It'd be interesting to do a, a comparison of body sizes in terrestrial and marine environments, which I don't think has been done. And if we look at the most common or widespread species in the oceans, these are all pelagic and one quarter are microscopic plankton and the remainder are the megafauna, the fish, birds, mammals, turtles that travel the oceans. Um, so in both of these groups have actually relatively few species. And the reason they have few species is because they have very high gene flow because they're so widespread. And if we think of species concepts, another argument um, people often use is comparing genetic and species diversity. So the common assumption is that if numbers of species richness goes up when there's more genetic diversity, and it'd be very easy to go do a search of papers and they find lots of genetic diversity in, this, in this, a group of taxa, and they immediately suggest that there's cryptic species here. But that's not necessarily true. You can have very high genetic diversity, for example, in bacteria, which are all the same species and sharing that DNA between each other. And if we look at the species diversity across these different groups, we actually find very high genetic diversity in viruses, more so than bacteria protozoans. So in fact, it's the reverse relationship than we're often thinking about. Um, and that's because depending on gene flow, you don't get species um, arising. So you can have very high genetic diversity, but it'll only convert into species diversity. And then of course, if, if species form, each of those species will have less genetic diversity than perhaps their ancestors. So, you know, as, as, they, as they separate into new species. I've always been interested in parasites as well. There was a few um, in my PhD study. And a lot of the literature would suggest that when they look at host specificity, they find as many parasites in a community as they do of host species. So this suggests a one-to-one -one relationship so in that case, half of all species on Earth should be parasites, but only 5% of named marine species, of, of all species are parasites. Um, it's a little bit more for marine species, perhaps from some recent research one of my students is doing. Um, so if you look at description rates of terrestrial parasites, like ticks, fleas, uh, streps, strep, there's a big long bird, streps, they're kind of little flies, um, microsporidia and biting flies, all of these rates are decreasing. I was really astonished when I looked at this. I wrote to all the experts in these groups who are compiling the lists, and they said this is true. It's very, they've been having a decreasing number of species in these groups for decades now. It's not just a once off, it's not just due to lack of experts because there's still enough people around. And then I realized that, well, these are very important for human well being and for, um, well, the real nuisance for human well-being and for our farm animals and our pets. So these are very well studied groups for a long time. <clears throat> so this marine species may be quite different. So I looked at the same for marine species. And on the graphs here, I have the numbers of uh, species being described. Um, and I have the, the, the numbers of um, species per author per decade, which is the, the squares at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Um, and what we see is that the actual numbers of new species of crustaceans and mollusks has been decreasing, but helminth worms, which are a lot of them are internal parasites, has been increasing. And the authors, which are the um, these uh, solid circles, the authors have been numbers of authors have been decreasing because as you get less species being described, there's less people. To needed to describe them since the 1950s. Sorry, the numbers of authors have been increasing. Oh, sorry. Um, so the numbers of the, the blue lines show that the number of species per author has been decreasing in a year over time. 
So this suggests that crustaceans and mollusks are really as almost as well known as terrestrial groups, and they're having decreasing rates of description, but not the helminth worms. And many of the recent parasite studies by um, Polunin and others have focused on helminth worms. So helminth worms are actually the exception in the overall parasite community. And the reason we realize in, when we think about this in hindsight is that if a parasite is not flexible with its host, it's probably going to, it has a risk of extinction. So some parasites must have some flexibility to uh, live on other hosts. And most potential hosts like insects have a small body size. So they don't really have that much space to host many parasites. Um, and most of the well-known studies have been on larger mammals, fish, um, birds, and other animals, which have multiple potential habitats on their body for parasites. So our view of parasite uh, diversity has been somewhat biased by looking at bigger animals and looking at the most common and abundant animals. As we look at rarer species, especially those related to those common species, we often find the same, they have the same parasites. So the parasites are really more specific to a genus or even a family. Um, of, of hosts. Um, another problem is, of course, that many hosts don't have any parasites, so their parasites are pretty hard to sample, and, um, and some hosts can even reduce their parasite burden over time due to grooming and cleaning. <clears throat> so deep sea diversity is extraordinary and fascinating, but how many species are down there? So to analyze this, we need to look at the environment, and if it seems to be perfect, it's got it's been around a long time, but in fact, now we realize the deep sea went anoxic in the past. So perhaps it had, it had, it had mass extinctions, perhaps more extinctions than shallow water. Um, but it's got lots of water, lots of space and a very um, stable temperature over time. And it's the biggest habitat on earth. So this graph here is showing that most of the area on earth and the volume in earth is actually in the deep sea between 2000 and 6,000 meters. But most of the diverse habitats and productivities in shallow water. Danusha has uh, published recently a new map of the world kelp biome, and she also did a seagrass biome. And this is such a narrow line around the coast, it's very hard to see. So on this map, we tried to exaggerate it somewhat. So these productive three-dimensional habitats, which are called biomes in terrestrial ecology, so we've used the same meaning here, are all coastal and particularly the coral reefs are in the tropics and the mangroves. And they are habitat for many other species. Similarly with phytoplankton, which is the other productivity is also very coastal. Usually marine biologists give the maps, usually the, the summertime in the north or the summertime in the south. So you get these big algal, they show the big algal blooms that are in the northern summer hemisphere. But if you take the annual average, most phytoplankton productivity is coastal and in the tropics and in the shallow water shells of uh, Northern Europe. So that's where most of the productivity is. And these extraordinary deep sea habitats, and there's in fact one of these deep sea reefs just uh, not far from where I'm living now off the coast here of Norway. Um, these are also extraordinary habitats which rich life, but they're not that widespread and common and they're much more simpler than the shallow water tropical corals. And these extraordinary deep sea habitats like hydrothermal vents are a temporary habitat. So they're more similar to a pond on land and freshwater ponds are isolated. So the only species that can live in them are species with high dispersal ability. So contrary to what we might think that a rare habitat would have rare species with it. In fact, a rare habitat has very common species because they have to have good dispersal ability to find that rare habitat again. And this is probably also the case with many insects that live on certain flowers and plants. Um, they have to be able to disperse well to find their, their habitat. So they're probably a lot more widespread than we realize from first sampling. So in the next uh, few examples, and we looked at, I'll talk about the Ocean Biogeographic Information System, which contains data on all kinds of marine species. And we can compare the richness in OBIS, which is the lower map here, which I've used ES50, which is you take repeated samples of your data set and uh, to get the number of species in 50 samples to standardize for sampling effort. And you compare it to species ranges in the really interesting AquaMaps online database. And in both of these cases, you can see that most species uh, come out in the shallow reefs and the tropics, pretty much where we saw those productive uh, marine biomes of mangroves, corals, 
uh, seaweed forests and um, seagrass. And if we look at the deep sea data in OBUS, which is a bit less, um, the cells here show the numbers of records, dark cells have more, or that have depth data. We see that there's a rapidly decreases on log scale in the numbers of samples. We expect there's less sampling in the deep sea. Um, and thus, we see a decrease in the total number of species. So this is also um, the case here. And if we want to standardize species by taking the mean number, this is the mean number at 95% confidence, or the ES50 with 95% standard errors, we can also see that we always get this rapid decrease in numbers of species as we go deeper. And we, we can look at lots of environmental data with True Bio Oracle and this uh, other website, GMED, that one of my students created. Um, and we can see what happens as we go deeper. We have this little epilogic zone at the surface here, um, which is where everything starts going, uh, where all the, the is, is the photosynthetic zone, the photic zone is a better word. Um, and then the mesopelagic is where we only have the animals in respiration, so oxygen decreases. And then as we go down deeper, temperature becomes very cold, less than four degrees, um, and nutrients stabilize. These three graphs are the minimum, mean, and maximum. And oxygen also decreases down to around four milligrams per liter. And anything below three milligrams per liter is, uh, and even below four and for many taxa, is very stressful and they can't live there. So the deep sea is basically as cold or colder than your fridge, it's darker um, and because it never gets light. And it also has barely enough oxygen for many species to live in. So it's really not a great place to be living. Um, and even water currents are very low in the deep sea. The currents are much higher in shallow water with tidally driven currents. So we classified the deep, the, the ocean three dimensions um, using with uh, collaboration with Esri and uh, Roger Sayer led, led this from USGS. Um, and we, this is the surface map and he called these ecological marine units. Um, there's a lovely phone app for these actually, which, which you can look at. And this provides a three dimensional slice through the oceans. And the thing I want you to take away here is that there's many coastal ecological marine units in the coast here that are so small we can't see them. And as we go deeper, we get fewer and fewer of these marine units because the environment is much more spatially homogeneous. So if a species is adapted to one of these little units in here, it's got actually a very small area that volume it can live in. But a species that lives in the deep sea can live in a much larger area. So even though there's fewer species in the deep sea, the other reason that there's fewer there is because as we go deeper in the sea, they can live in a much uh, larger area. Uh, geographically and with depth. So if we take sea pens for an example, and this applies, I've seen similar papers on decapods and other groups. Um, this is a list, each bar here is a genus, and we can see that they're organized by their depth range, and many species only occur in very, very shallow depths, and the species that occur in deeper water have much deeper depth ranges. And there's only one species that appears to be endemic uh, to the deep sea here, and whether that really is, maybe more sampling, people will discover more samples in shallower water. So that's why I'll, I'll skip this slide. It's, it's the same point to save time. Um, so we can't really understand global species richness without understanding biogeography. Um, this helps us by widespread in relation to gene flow, in relation to microscopic deep sea and parasite species. Um, and our, my conclusion from what we've done is that new discoveries are not going to change the pattern of what we know now. So about 15% of species are marine, 10% are microscopic, and 5% are parasites. And most of these marine species occur in the coastal tropics. Um, but of course, many endemic species outside of those areas, like New Zealand, half the species are endemic, half the species in Antarctica are endemic. So if we look at uh, rarity and endemicity, uh, there's also many interesting species outside the coastal tropics. And I still think um, I, sometimes I've, due to peer pressure, I've been pushed to try and expand the 2 million up to a higher number. And sometimes I'm about to, but then I fall back and I look at the numbers and I really don't see the evidence yet. But there's still hundreds of thousands of more species to be discovered. Um, there could be still half a million unnamed species out there. So it's still quite a lot to do.
Um, so what does this all mean? Um, well, one application is looking at uh, marine protected areas and Arawan Assad uh, did his PhD with me a few years ago and now works as a climate change advisor to the Indonesian government. Um, and he was interested to look at where marine reserves would be best located in the Coral Triangle to protect biodiversity because the initial reserves were basically just picked because somebody championed having a reserve in this place. And we know the Coral Triangle has seems to have more marine species than anywhere else on Earth. Um, so first, Arawan reviewed criteria used to select and prioritize areas published in biological conservation. Then he collected the data from the region. He collected data on habitats like coral, seagrass, mangroves, um, rare species from a fish database. And it's really interesting that basically Roger Ampat here at the end of Papua New Guinea is a real rich place. So if any of you have money for a holiday sometime, maybe in years in the future, once the pandemic is over, Roger Ampat must be the place that every marine biologist should go. And he collected data on sea turtles and uh, species richness from Obus as well. And he pulled all this together and was able to overlay it and the red areas here where there'd be um, this, this is the highest density of, of species. He then used zonation software to kind of pick the smallest area that would have the most species. And he published two papers with these methods. Um, and he ended up with a map more or less like this. So showing which 30% of the Coral Triangle would be the most effective area to protect. We then decided to look at, do this for the world as uh, computational power was increasing. And a few years earlier, I had done an analysis of the data in OBIS and defined 30 biogeographic realms. Very crudely, these are defined by five degree cells um, due to the sparseness of the underlying data. Um, and we can see here that most of these realms, as you'd imagine, so these realms are based on endemicity by cluster analysis. So it's the same as doing a DNA analysis on people. You find out which areas or groups of people have the most in common um, and the most differences. And we find that coastal areas tend to have more realms. You can see the Black Sea and the Baltic Sea are different, Northeast Atlantic and so on. New Zealand is different. Um, and the offshore areas are larger because these are pelagic and deep sea areas, which are very much more homogenous habitats. So if a species can live in one part of the Southern Ocean, it can live probably in any part of the Southern Ocean. And this is a lovely example here by some famous people who may be in the audience of um, how you've, you've had much better data uh, for Brazil than was available when we were doing our analysis. And one can show that there are distinct biogeographic regions along the coast of South Atlantic South America. And it'd be great um, to do more studies like this as data appears and come up with a much better biogeography of the oceans in due course. So uh, we took together the species richness maps based on uh, aquamaps overlays of about 24,000 species with the realms and we defined, because you want to protect the unique species, not just the areas richest species. So we subdivided the the species richness into areas with different realms of endemicity. And we combine that with ecosystems um, and the biomaps and seabed rugosity as an indicator of topographic variation um, to come up with a map of what 30 the top 30% of the ocean for biodiversity would look like. And as you know, that there's been calls for 30% of the ocean and 30% of land to be protected by 2030 by all countries. What's very annoying is that people seem to have very different understandings of what protected means. Um, we might think protected actually means protected, but um, apparently not when it comes to many governments. That's another story. Um, and, you know, the Coral Triangle region jumps out as been very high richness here, but also many areas along the coasts and even in offshore areas as well. So I think about, ooh, I've forgotten the numbers, about nearly 40% of the areas to be protected are actually in the high seas and outside coastal areas, uh, exclusive economic zones. Um, so if we looked at um, latitudinal gradients, so in these graphs, we have the equator in the center and we have latitude and here it's going from the north to the south. So Hani was doing her PhD on razor clams and she found this latitudinal gradient. So we thought this must be a mistake, this gap here. So she went to many of the museums around the world, checked all these specimens, 
and she found this gap actually got deeper. Um, so in fact, razor clams, most of them occur in the subtropics and relatively few cross the equator. But that's just one example. So we thought, and she had difficulty getting it published when she called it bimodal because the journal said you can't call it bimodal because everybody knows that this gap is just a sampling gap or it's just unique to one taxon. So we got a bit annoyed by that. It's nothing better than getting a bit annoyed and going to the literature. And with Chaya, who was starting her PhD, we reviewed over 60, 70 papers. And every paper had a little decrease in richness at the equator. We thought, oh, this is surprising. And this is what we expect from global warming. Um, so this is our review of the literature here um, and data in OBUS in the graphs. Um, and we see that if we just look at the average number of species per latitude, of course, we get the highest number um, in the Northern Hemisphere. North is now on the right, um, because that's where most samples are taken. But if we take the total number, we get it's almost symmetrical and bimodal. And if we take the estimated species richness, it's bimodal, and we see this, this dip at the equator. And Chai went on to look at time periods, which was just published last month in PNAS. Um, and in the PNS paper, we actually used three time periods, but it's a little bit simpler just to look at two. So if we look at before and before, after 1985, because that's around when global temperature, sea temperatures really started warming consistently after this period. Before that, temperatures are warming and even cooling in some places of the ocean. And so blue is, is afterwards and red is before. Um, and we can see that there's an increase in the subtropics. Here it's in benthic species. We see a decrease at the equator, especially for pelagic species, but also here. And we can see that overall species, we have this very strong dip at the equator. And in a previous paper we published last year, we showed that, in fact, during the Ice Age, if we look at fossil core data, biodiversity of foraminifera, planktonic peaked at the equator, and it's been decreasing at the equator since the last ice age, but now it's decreasing even faster due to climate change. And we also see evidence for a northern shift here in the, in the tax as well, which has been shown at species level studies before. But this is the first time it's been shown for so many species. And if we add up these numbers, this suggests thousands of species have been lost from the equator already since in the last few decades. Um, and they haven't been gone extinct. Um, they've moved into the subtropics. <clears throat> Another interesting pattern we observed was a standardized global survey called the Reef Life Survey, organized by Graham Edgar and Rick Stewart Smith in Tasmania. And these pictures tell the story here. So in this tropics, uh, this is Roger Ampat, which I mentioned before, you see this high abundance of fish, they're everywhere. But if you come up to Norway here, um, you see very few fish, what you see is invertebrates dominating the benthos. And here's in California, this case in Chile, um, you see the same uh, patterns up here in Norway, with very rich benthos and relatively few fish. And no, only a few species of fish up here actually graze on the benthos. Most of them are plankton feeders or uh, eat animals that are swimming around. Um, and if we look at the data, that's also what this study showed. So we see with latitude from zero up to high latitudes, it could be either north or west or north or south here. Both for vertebrates, which is mostly fish, but a few turtles, um, and mobile invertebrates, um, we see this uh, inverse relationship. So we actually see as there is fish dominate so much in the tropics and subtropics, I think that they outcompete invertebrates and they're possibly also driving evolutionary patterns of speciation. Because if you live, if you're an invertebrate, it's very hard to compete with fish because they're mobile and can swim around and catch you easily. Um, but as you move into the, the colder temperatures, uh, the invertebrates have a, an advantage. So once upon a time, um, just checking my time. Sorry, I'm going a bit over time. Um, I thought most species were microscopic, marine, in the deep sea, taxonomic effort is decreasing and marine species richness peaked at the equator. So I've been wrong many times in my life. So I still might be wrong at some things. Um, so some of the lessons I've learned is not to believe all I read or hear. So we must be very skeptical scientists. Being a skeptic is actually a good thing. People sometimes use it if it's a bad thing. Um, and we must test beliefs against data and facts. And it's really exciting when we, I, I find it really exciting when I discover something and I think I've made a mistake or it's something wrong. And it turns out to be true, 
was contrary to my expectation. I think that's how we make discoveries. And also finding good people to collaborate with. So thank you very much. I can't see you all now, but I believe you can see me. So um, um, I can take some questions. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, for an excellent presentation. Now I is open this, this space for a discussion. And now I go the, the question for Hook and um, I'll do a start. Yeah, I, I'll start with some comments. Uh, very, uh, thank you very much for the presentation, Mark. Uh, and it was very, very nice to, to see all the, this um, statements <laughs> uh, being checked uh, the, the, there was this, that everyone th thought for a long time that yeah. it was yeah uh, okay so mm. in the meantime people can can uh, put questions in the in the chat here and we can we can read it for mark here okay uh, but um, well, ju just a few comments. Um, so it, it, it is uh, very interesting to, to know that we are approaching, uh, it seems that we are approaching the, the real number of species on Earth. That, mm. that's, that's great because uh, mm. everyone was always thinking that, that we were just scratching the surface. That yeah. was that's very interesting to 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 know. Uh, mm. But in, in terms of the the biogeography, the the biogeography of the oceans, do you think when we um, put it all together, the pelagic, the band, the different packs, uh, of course we we lose some aspects. We we get others, but how do you think about the the proportions? What I mean is, um, you you may have a proportion of uh, some taxon or some uh, bandic or pelagic uh, taxon that will drive more into the, the the delineation of the areas. How how do you think about that? What do you think about that? Yeah. So so one way we I did the analysis with that was by taking all the pelagic species and doing the cluster analysis on them alone. And then I came up with, I think, about five by geographic regions. Um, and the unfortunate thing about the analysis is that it agreed with people who published papers on this, like uh, Ekman in 1935 or 1940 or something. He actually had more or less the same regions I found with my data analysis. And uh, I got a very nice review from uh, Nature, I think, or Science. I can't remember. They said, this is a great paper. And then the editor said, yeah, but you're only supporting the data from a study that's, you know, 70 years old or something. So this is not very new. So they rejected it on editorial grounds. So uh, maybe that's how I went to Nature Communications, actually. I can't remember. But uh, yeah, so, and the same with the pelagic biogeographers. The Russians have done really nice work on pelagic by geography, actually, a lot of the best work. And they also come up with relatively few pelagic regions. So uh, I, the way I see it is that, that probably, but it hasn't really been shown clearly, that the benthic regions are nested inside the pelagic regions. Because the pelagic region only considers the water mass. The benthic region considers the water mass and the benthic uh, seabed environment as well. So it's got an additional kind of environmental variable that will separate the species. So that's that's the way I, I think. And and you know then if I, you know if Nando Guerrero has some very nice papers. Uh, you might know Nando from Italy, where he points out that really the we shouldn't be separating these differences because all benthic species, most many benthic species have pelagic larvae. So for some time in their lives, everything can almost everything is pelagic. There's very few things that are never pelagic. And even amphipods, which I did my PhD on. We used to think because most are benthic and they have no free living larvae that they'll be very, um, they will have lots of species in high endemicity, but we've just finished some global analyses and it's not true. So obviously these little, a lot of these creatures are able to get around the ocean very well. And uh, I suspect they're traveling at night 
in the darkness so the fish can't catch them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. Yep. Uh, it was I, I was always uh, that, that's my last comment um, I was amazed to know that we will probably not find that many species in the deep sea as people uh, thought uh, some 10 20 years ago and I, and I agree yeah. with that that main, many of them will have large distributions that's mm. the main point isn't it Mark? Yeah, that, that's right. And, and in fact, Ekman and some of the fish people in, you know, more, before the First World War already knew this from their very first sampling. They said that when they go to the deep sea, they catch the same fish and the same things very far apart, which doesn't happen in shallow waters. So, but a lot of these original ideas by the natural historians, um, they just had the power of observation and uh, they didn't need databases and all this kind of stuff to see what they could see in front of their eyes. <laughs> but for some reason, nobody reads anything that's more than a few years old anymore. So we overlook a lot of these early studies, which uh, uh, I think is, uh, but maybe now as citizen science, we'll have more natural history coming back in. It's uh, quite exciting. Do you have any question, uh, Hudson, or we should we go to the chat? Yeah. Uh, I yeah, I'd like to talk about this pattern, like the latitudinal patterns of richness, which shows like these peaks in the subtropics. I was like trying to think about like we found the same thing like here in Brazil. We would like to test yeah. if like if the richness decrease like in um like linearly from the Caribbean to the south, but we found that not like we found in the center coast of Brazil, like in the transition zone between the tropical uh, realm and the subtropical ones we found the peak of diversity and we discussed oh. that like uh, we discussed because we found a lot of um, endemic fish there and we thought that were like the process of uh, the evolutionary process that happens if like the difference of habitats like more subtropical species like up, and the overlap between tropical and subtropical and I was thinking about that, like we found here, and at the same time, when you take a look in the Atlantic Ocean, like the Caribbean, that is like the center of diversity here in the Atlantic, it's also not in the equator too. Like what we have in the equator mm. is like the Amazon mouth is like a, or open water, you know, like in the equator. So like, I think that in here, in the Atlantic, you have this classic example, you know, but mm. like, the coral triangle that is the place where we have the highest diversity on earth there you know especially marine is exactly inside the tropics like the equator crosses yeah. the, like the middle of the coral triangle you know Haj Hampa mm -hmm. that you talk about is like few degrees like is Philippines is not more than 10 degrees you know mm -hmm. like so what do you think do you think that the Atlantic if that has less much less diversity maybe has much more studies much more sampling and this might be creating a kind of bias or do you think that there is something going on on the coral triangle and is losing biodiversity to the to the subtropicals of the of the indo-pacific yeah. as well like like it's, it's a really it's, really good question yeah. I've been wondering exactly these questions and uh, with Shane Wright, who's a genetic evolutionary biologist in Auckland, uh, I teach in a course with him and we always, we even have public arguments in front of the students. The students love it when the professors have an argument and with Shane Lavery about these issues. So we, we debate these ideas back and forth because we don't really know the answer, but it's fun to have an argument. Um, so what uh, I discovered recently we had two workshops on temperature and we invited a, a physiologist who works on microbes and bacteria. He's a statistical modeler. And I didn't realize that 20 degrees is the optimal temperature for cell function across all life on Earth. So there's something and it's something to do with even the properties of water, that water changes its properties. Water is a very strange molecule. and. Um, so that the most efficient temperature for all life on Earth is 20 degrees. He's shown this, and it's the most stable temperature. So if you've got a, you know enzymes, uh, different enzymes and proteins being made in cells, then 20 degrees is just perfect. But of course, all life can't live at 20 degrees because there's competition. So some species 
adapt to live in colder and even more adapt to live in warmer because the pace of life is warmer. So the 20 degrees is more or less the temperature of the subtropics now. In the past, 20 degrees was the, you know, the last ice age, it was uh, around the equator, it was 20 degrees, and then maybe in the past it was different. So even when we look at the fossil history, I've been reading some of these papers and talking to Moriaki Yozahara, um, when people look at those fossils, they, don't, they weren't always at the equator, even, you know, those very warm periods of Earth. So I'm sus I suspect that during those warm ages on Earth, there probably were many more species, but they weren't necessarily in the warmest part of the planet. They could have as well also been around the 20 degrees zone. Um, so we have a paper just submitted yesterday to uh, Trends in Ecology, again, because the first time we sent it, the referees didn't like it. One of them just didn't believe us. <laughs> he says, I can't believe this. <laughs> so we, we had to write, <laughs> change the graphs and show all the evidence again. But anyway, so hopefully it'll be accepted. So we, we just, it was quite amazing that 20 degrees always turns out to be kind of ideal. And, and if we look at productivity of uh, phytoplankton and seaweeds, if they look across numbers of species, the rest, it's something to do with photosynthesis and respiration rates. As you go over 20 degrees, photosynthesis becomes less efficient and respiration becomes more important because animals have to, and plants have to respire, but they don't have to photosynthesize. So as it gets warmer, it gets more and more challenging for all life. And when in the PNAS paper we have, if we draw curves of temperature and numbers of species, they always start decreasing somewhere above 20 degrees, sometimes 24. Reef fish seem to have a higher temperature tolerance, but maybe this is some anomaly. Might be we need to look at it a bit more, but most groups and the pelagic groups especially seem to decrease rapidly after 20 degrees. They don't like it too hot, but pelagic species can usually find would rarely probably be in above 20 degrees in the open oceans. So I think, I think the, yeah, I think my, our mindset was, we always thought the equator was the, you know, the Goldilocks story, the Goldilocks and the three bears. I don't know if they, they told this child story in, in Brazil, but uh, you know, the Goldilocks zone is when the temperature is just right. So I and think that we rule out the, the, many people say that we are not, we don't have that, uh, the, the same thing before that, that the, the near the equator is not that good. Do you, do yeah, you, that's true. Can I elaborate on that? Yeah, it, it is not that good. And in fact, in our paper, sorry, I couldn't, you're my, I wasn't sure your, your video freezes. So I wasn't sure if you were still talking, but, but we're, we're actually looking at the equatorial data and we can't find, there's lots of studies in the Northern hemisphere and Australia about species that are moving due to climate change observed locations not models but we can't find any for the equator so how come nobody's because i guess nobody's really counting them there very carefully so the obus database is so big that just you could just see these trends so we're starting to look now at the more common species in the database a little bit more closely to see are there some species in obus we can show that they're decreasing at the equator and increasing at the subtropics to make make a list of those species that are moving yeah, but in Brazil, you might have some really nice examples of this. Uh, I don't know, maybe. Yeah, Mark, you have two questions here in the, the chat, and I can ah. read this, this, this question. Yeah, I, I, don't see the, I don't see the chat. Yeah, you uh, know. If you read some comments here, maybe, uh, check if you have this ah. uh, this part in the, in the right. Oh. oh, yeah, okay, many comments. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a comment from Fernanda here, Fernanda yeah. Silva. The low number yeah. of bacteria species in relation to the megafauna could associate the sampling methods or for some microbes, some organisms in taxonomy in progress. Sorry, could you repeat that again? I didn't yes. quite... Uh, the Fernanda Silva question, the low number of the bacteria species in relation to the megafauna could be bacteria. Uh, to sampling methods for some Microsoft organisms in taxonomy progress. This could affect the richness? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, not really, because actually bacteria, a lot of people study bacteria. You know, most universities, our university, I think there's probably more people can identify bacteria than microfauna now because it's, it's so important for aquaculture and medicine and veterinary science. Um, 
but bacteria people don't really care about species anymore. They've moved on. They're not looking at you know at individual clones and and groups of bacteria uh, because bacteria can share DNA. So they they have very high gene flow, very high uh, genetic mutation rates. Um, and there's a theory. Um, oh, uh, Sergio might remind me that there's a theory that microbes are everywhere. The environment selects. Um, it was actually by a Dutchman, I think, who moved to Indonesia at this theory. Somebody, any biographer, remember? Um, and it's a theory from more than 100 years ago that basically little animals are everywhere, protozoans and others. And uh, I, I know that, but I forgot the name too. <laughs> okay. But it, it's actually quite true. There was a whole set of papers in the 1970s and 80s by some uh, English and uh, I think Dutch uh, biologists, which showed this was true for protozoans. But a few people criticized them without any data. You know, the only criticism was that we can find a rare species in this lake that doesn't occur anywhere else. But it didn't actually disagree with their theory at all, because they're talking about a generality. And of course, you have endemic rare species everywhere. Uh, but generally, these little bacteria, I mean, they, the, the, the air is full of bacteria and protozoans and small insects and animals that fly. And we know this because the birds or bats are feeding on them. Um, so there's, an, there's aerial plankton as well. And probably in the ocean, you know, if we put any water out, we immediately get algae growing in it, um, no matter what salinity it is, it seems. So there's a lot of things that are dispersed in the air, these microbial things. So they're very widely dispersed. And this increases gene flow and reduces the number of species being formed. So I think I think that's why. Okay. Mark, I have Virginic, one. Virginic, that was the name. Yeah. I have one more curiosity because I think it's about your presentation. You show the different uh, relationships to species, richness, and latitude, uh, hopes and mention. But I think it's, for example, historically, uh, hotspot the richness all the time change in, in different times. For example, the freeze uh, hotspot, the diversity is the Mediterranean Sea, and now mm -hmm. it's the uh, triangle of the, uh, the coral reefs. Yeah. But I suppose this changes because the climatic change, all the species change the, the distribution range. And in your opinion, mm -hmm. uh, how is the extinction rates you can wait in this place because mm. the climatic change increasing the temperature probably this species is no more seas and but don't have more space for uh, move for another size for example and you don't mm. have more reef area or large reef area and how do you think about the, this this point yeah Even i think the big, risk, the, 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 more yeah, the big risk for yeah i know <laughs> uh, the, for marine extinctions from climate change is um yes yeah, in the mediterranean the red sea some of these enclosed seas where the species can't escape mm -hmm. um because they would have to cross so it's it's interesting it, it seems contrary that species are moving faster in the oceans down on land in relation to climate change and we can detect it much better they seem to follow their thermal leash very accurately and I think there's two reasons for that is because number one, they have to, they don't have any choice. Whereas if you live on land, you can maybe become nocturnal or live in the, live in the shade or find some means of losing heat or avoiding it. Uh, so they have to move. And the second is um, that they can move because their habitat is not fragmented. They can disperse by pelagic larvae or by mobile adults. So this, so extinction rates are marine species may have high local loss rates but they're not global extinctions but globally i would don't expect many species to go extinct except perhaps in the mediterranean or the red sea which have quite a high number of endemic species and species may be trapped in there and um, because as the temperature is warm northwards the species the species are going to become increasingly trapped in those areas maybe but uh, we just have to see and monitor them yeah. Mark, I have other questions do, here. Uh, do you think do you okay. think that the species can change like the bathymetric bathymetric range, like to in order to try to mm. like in the tropics or like uh, the centers of biodiversity could keep like the biodiversity, for example, like because yeah. as you go a little deeper, the water gets a little cooler, right? So yeah, 
Yeah, you much cooler actually, very quickly. Yeah, I think. Well, they, they have this uh, term subtropical, no tropical submergence in biogeography as well for pelagic biogeography for the the radial area or one of the phyla of, of plankton protozoans. So they're they're well known to have this deeper uh, distribution in the tropics than they do in temperate areas. So they basically follow their temperature habitat. So probably a lot of marine species will be able to go deeper, at, and at least enough of them will go deeper to survive. And there's some suggestion in the North Atlantic that areas that have very steep slope, that the species stay there. So probably what happens if, if it gets too hot in the summer, they just swim down into colder temperatures and survive. And then when the temperatures cool down again later in the year, they'll, they can come back into the surface waters. So we may see some type of movement, and maybe this already happens in, uh, in some tropical uh, or subtropical areas that species avoid the temperature. I, th I think it's really interesting too, not, not to mention this is, is the ocean oxygen. Um, mm -hmm. I think this is probably a real driver for both body size. So some of my students are looking at this now um, because uh, it's it really much more limiting. And I realized the, the analysis I showed of those, ox those uh, ecological marine units so we calculated uh, what percentage of the ocean is below three milligrams per liter. And it's something like 40% of the Indian Ocean. So nearly half of the Indian Ocean doesn't have enough oxygen for most species. <laughs> it's amazing. And the, the Pacific Ocean also is nearly 30%. All the mesopelagic in the North Pacific is a huge volume um, that doesn't have enough oxygen. So only that the, there's some species that are very small fish that can live there and they migrate. And then the squid and the and the, the mammals that can dive down who, who can go anaerobic or can um, go hunting the, those fish. So there's, it's I think uh, the amount of oxygenated habitat is also decreasing, and something we may have underestimated. Yeah. There's other questions here. Uh, some some people are saying that we. Uh, what about uh, comparisons? in similar habitats, habitats uh, in standardized mm. areas, if you have any particular idea on that, comparing to this whole biogeographical regions. Yeah. <laughs> and other people start uh, already saying uh, the taxonomic biases, that in some places we know more than others, how we can safely assume uh, that these patterns are really like that. Mm. Yeah, this, for sure, there's, these are all problems that we have to try and address when we're interpreting the data. We need to be quite careful. I remember comparing species lists from around the world for part of the census of marine life. And then I realized that there was no polychaetes in Israel, not one. <laughs> so uh, then there was no seaweeds in, in Canada in their list. So. You know, these global communities have put together a list and they completely forgot the entire taxa, like phyla, kingdoms. So it was, uh, yeah, it's, we need to be very careful to try and, and do these things. That's why the Reef Life Survey is uh, so exciting. It's, um, we, should, we should get involved in this, Sergio, later. Um, but it's a standardized scuba diving survey. It's very similar to what a lot of scuba surveys already do. But they have a really nice database, photographic identification, and they involve uh, citizen scientists and scientists. And this produces standardized data. They've had lots of nice papers showing uh, ab with abundance data as well, because it's on a standard length. So I think, but of course that only covers reef fish, coral and rocky reef fish. So what about other types of habitats? Yeah. So I think for younger scientists here, if you're interested in a particular habitat, it's, there's so many scientists around the world doing work, try to form a community where you have similar methods and uh, compare data, compare trends, and then you can see a bigger picture, not just your local picture, but we can suddenly see the, the, the bigger context. And uh, I think that's often the, the solution when we look for a pattern in our local data set and we're really disappointed we don't see it. We just need to sample a little bit further away or somewhere beyond it. And then we see, we see the rest of the picture because often we're only, we're only looking at one little part of the picture sometimes and we, we can't see the bigger picture. And Mark, like about this bias, I have a 
comment and i would like to hear a little bit more about you like we saw that the number of authors are increasing as the number of species are being dis, uh, described so it gives a feeling that like the number of taxonomies is increasing in the world but at the same time i had the opportunity to work in a big museum and i saw like the struggles that they are having now you know to keep the, their work mm -hmm. and we hear about like other oh, museums closing and lack of funding for museums mm -hmm. and in the universities too you know like the the taxonomy papers like that uh, are like the journals that are specialized you can see that the the impact factor are not that very high you know like they don't get like they get when you find some new species you get attention is important but it seems that for the scientific world in, like it has less importance than for like the pe people for the society you know like and mm. we actually i like personally i'm not sure if the number of positions for taxonomists is increasing you know or if the, the diversity of taxonomy mm. is increasing you know like so do you feel that these numbers of authors they reflect more people in the labs that are really like labs that are classic labs that work with taxonomy more people working like mm. more biologists in general being more students students in general or do you think that like more positions are being open that the world or the university are getting more support mm. or the taxonomy like the the science of the taxonomy is getting more support what do you think like that is mm. controlling this increasing in the number of authors yeah well the, the nice thing is we know their names we actually know the names of the people in the databases we know where they live we, <laughs> we know where they work or their addresses so there have been a few ad analyses looking at institutional addresses and that shows uh, there was a german report which surprised me because it showed an increased number of publications of new species on every continent um, which was contrary to what people were saying. And then if you talk to Ji Kang Zhang, who runs Zoo Taxa and Phytotaxa, his journal has just exploded in the last 15 years. And he's publishing a monograph every two days. Um, so huge volume. So the amount of publications in, in taxonomy is definitely increasing, there's, there's no doubt. And, the, and the, because of open access and online publication, this has made it easier and it's much faster than it used to be. Um, for sure, in some museums. So the, the other problem is, is what is a taxonomist, which is a difficult question to answer. Because you could say, what is an ecologist? And then say, oh, no, no, he studies molecular biology. He's not a real ecologist. Or you could say, you know, so people often have the view of a traditional taxonomist who does nothing else except describe species morphologically. Well, of course, those people are de decreasing because now we have extra techniques, molecular techniques, and maybe they're more interested in biogeography or ecology or phylogeny or evolutionary history. So w when when they do, they've done reports in Canada, the UK, and Australia, New Zealand on taxonomic uh, uh, expertise, and they always define it very widely. They include the molecular biologists and the phylogeneticists and the people who don't even describe species, the people who do species identification, they're all regarded as taxonomists. But when you write a taxonomic paper and you try to say what is a person naming a species a taxonomist, you say, oh, well, some of these people are not real taxonomists. They only name species. So it's, it's a very hard question to answer. So I think, I think what happens in, in Asia at the moment is there are people who are now doing full-time taxonomy because there's so many species to name. It's very easy to come in every day and just, just keep describing your species and become a specialist. And two of my students are doing that now in amphipods and polychaetes in Indonesia. And they will have no problem describing species for the rest of their lives, I think. Uh, but you, you couldn't do that in Europe. <laughs> you would have to go, you know, Europe is very difficult to find a new species of amphipod in Europe now or polychaetes would be quite unusual. So uh, you may find a few, but you couldn't make a whole career from doing just that. So I think that's that's what happens in time that what was a taxonomist now diversifies. And yeah, you're right about the citation rates and impact factor. That is a problem. Um, it's also a problem if you're a statistician or a, a mathematics person, they get very low, cit even lower citations than taxonomists. <laughs> so it's uh, different disciplines of different citation rates and uh, 
yeah, they need different metrics. It's that's that's another whole discussion, I guess, how we how we evaluate it. But I think if we look in fifty years, you know, if if you if I described a new species and I told my neighbors, they would immediately understand what I did. But if I tried to explain to them some of the biogeographic work, they, they wouldn't. <laughs> It'll be more difficult. I think everybody understands the value of naming a new chemical or describing a new molecule or describing a new species. It's it's fundamental science that everything else will build on. And it's, uh, you know, I think I think it's I think it's still quite exciting. The public appreciates it. Yeah. So maybe well, taxonomists are getting more generalists, like the scientists that work are yeah. getting more generalists, yeah. maybe. Yeah, I think they're looking a bit deeper beyond the species and looking into evolutionary relationships. And there was a nice a guy in Bangladesh who was a botanist, did a really nice paper on the history of, of botanists in Bangladesh. And he showed this continuum from, from the individuals who did only taxonomic descriptions to then people doing taxonomic and ecological papers. And now they nearly all study ecology or agriculture or something. So, that, you know, the field moves, advances over time. So. Mm. Great. Okay. Uh, you have two more questions or more comments here in the, the chat. I, and I think this is the last question because it's the time is, is the eight in this moment. I uh, yeah, has asked some good questions. Yeah. yeah. Assuming assumptions have a firm grip in reality. Yeah. So yeah, we have to test some data, go out and try to find some data that tests it somehow. Um, that's the real, the fast way to, to advance science. You can, we can do a lot about describing things and looking at patterns, but if we have a, a good question or an assumption or a theory, and then we can challenge this with some data, that's mm -hmm. really how scientists move. Well, they call it hypothesis testing. You know, you can call it that way too, so. Yes. Yeah, but the generalizations are very helpful because they give us, they kind of give us the painting of the big picture and then then we find the exceptions to these generalizations. And why is this species or this group exceptional? Um, so I have an example looking at uh, Martha Pages from Spain, who's um, came and worked in our lab and she's written a paper, we hope to submit soon, on the latitudinal gradient in benthic epifauna. And we're really surprised that Antarctica has as many species of benthic epifaunal species as occur in the tropics, because the whole of Antarctica, you see the photographs, they're covered in echinoderms and mussels and crustaceans and hydroids. It, it's just covered there. And, and and half of them are endemic in Antarctica. So suddenly we realize, well, temperature is obviously not the only reason for species richness. Antarctica has, there's less fish, there's less fish competition. So I think the invertebrates there are more diverse. So maybe that's, that's why it's an exception, like a climate refuge. Yeah, so good good questions. Mark, right. thanks again for your time and this excellent presentation, very nice. And thanks, Hoxon and Sergi for participating in this discussion, very important. And see you on the after opportunity. Pessoal, muito obrigado a todos que estão nos assistindo hoje, principalmente os nossos palestrantes. Então, gostaria de convidar vocês para a próxima quinta-feira. Mark, please. Thank you very much. That's great. Okay. Yeah, it was nice. Let's let's keep talking. Yeah. Yeah. Look forward. You've got really nice data, really nice work you're doing. Congratulations. Okay. See you. And See exchanging you. students in the in the near future. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay. Thanks, bye bye.